So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's just kind of see how you fared against a study that was done earlier this year by uh, CryptZone. And uh, their results here, I think it was a little over like 150 respondents or so, and only about 7% had SharePoint 2007, where the majority, it was kind of mixed between 2010 and 2013, and then a few people were on online. Uh, and this was as about April of, of this year, so it is fairly recent. Um, so it doesn't surprise me at all, that at least in this survey, that 2007 is really starting to trail off. All right, so before you can potentially understand why you should or shouldn't upgrade or, or migrate to SharePoint 2013 or to 365, Office 365, I think it's important to kind of know where the big improvements in SharePoint 2010 are, or especially since 2007. Um, there has been a ton of changes, and basically what I try to do is call out just the important ones that might impact you for doing upgrades and, and migration. So just first of all, just kind of in the, the web technology space, there was just greatly improved browser support. So now we fully support the latest versions of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and in terms of IE, it, uh, you can have IE 8 or, or higher. So they basically dropped IE 7 from the compatibility list. And really now HTML5 and CSS3, kind of the, stand, the platform standards of, of, of web uh, code, have really kind of become the, the standards. The, all the SharePoint code and everything for uh, HTML is not uh, HTML5 or CSS3 by default right now, but it fully supports you know doing CSS3 uh, and everything and taking advantage of all those uh, new features. Um, and they also reduce the dependency on the ActiveX controls. So basically, an example in uh, in 2010 or whatever, you're used to going into data sheet view, uh, you know, pretty commonly that you had to have an ActiveX control to to do that installed as part of Office. So in 2013, they actually renamed that Quick Edit. And you can actually do that uh, cross-browser without any kind of ActiveX controls or Office, or if you have 64-bit Office or whatever that, that case is. So next, we just want some of the branding features. The first big one uh, I would consider would be Design Manager. So some people kind of don't like this feature, but what it does is it provides the ability to really take a standard HTML and CSS website design. You can just go out to the internet, download a free HTML template. Um, and you can suck that into SharePoint, and it will attempt, although sometimes kind of poorly, uh, to convert it over to, uh, it'll build dynamically build a SharePoint master page for you. Um, it only gets you maybe about 20% of the way. There's still a lot of things you kind of have to fix post that, but it definitely kind of gets things wired. Um, it does a decent job. Uh, next thing here is device channels, and basically so what those allow you to do is, is take a, uh, you can target different master pages two different devices based on their type. So, you know, in your browser, you have the user agent string. Um, so you can target, you can say, well, this master page that's maybe more geared for, for mobile goes to an iPhone, uh, and this other one will go to, you know, tablet or an iPad or whatever the case is. But with, uh, in all honesty, with responsive design and all these other web technologies the way they are today, I really don't see device channels getting a, a ton of traction. Um, and then kind of lastly here, we have, uh, they made a lot of improvements with theming. Uh, and they made it a lot easier to actually, you know, you can just upload a, a new background image on, on your site. You can have a little more control on the themes and colors. You can actually, the site layout listing there is actually you're picking your master page um, and set your, your fonts and whatnot. And then if you want to get really custom, you could actually download the SharePoint uh, color palette tool uh, where you can set, you know, 70 or 80 different um, accent combinations and stuff. So you get a lot of flexibility there. And the next, I'm sure you're likely very familiar, especially if you're on 2010, you're familiar with the managed metadata service and having this corporate taxonomy. Um, obviously, that didn't exist back in 2007, but in now in 2013, you can actually use that corporate taxonomy to actually drive your navigation. So you can define a term set whose really sole purpose is navigation. So then you can, um, when you go under here in this top uh, entry here, you go under your, your navigation site settings, and you can pick manage navigation there. Um, but also this feature also allows you to give friendly URLs to publishing pages. So instead of you know having like your um, c5insight.com/pages/contact-us.aspx kind of URL, it allows you to actually define like c5insight.com/contact-us. You know, it just gives it a much more kind of friendly uh, URL. So next, just some a uh, couple of things with site functionality I wanted to call out. Um, firstly, we have a minimal download strategy, and what this is all about is about 
um, really minimizing and minimizing your your page load and uh, really improving your page load performance. So it compares the difference between the page that you're on and then the page that you're going to and sees what's different and then it only loads those differences between those those pages. So and you can tell sites that have the uh, minimal download strategy turned on. There's a site feature that you can just turn that on or off, and you'll see that start.aspx pound in the URL, and that means that it's using the minimal download strategy. So next is that uh, you know I bet a lot of you have sites out there that if you look at their you know you look at the last time that all the sites were modified, they you know probably haven't been touched in a while in like two or three years. So 2010 had this ability to use information management policies to actually expire documents. So if you wanted to say, you know, documents would move to a record center after five years or seven years after their, their created or modified date, well now in 2013 you can do that with uh, websites, with uh, subsites or site collections. So here's a little screenshot where you can actually just delete them, you can close them, you can mark them, uh, the site collections read only. You can define uh, what things should happen for that the site owners to get notified, you know, ahead of time. So um, while it's not the most awesome thing in the world, it definitely gives you a lot more ability to try to put in some more governance in place um, to really try to help keep your your site, um, you know, where you just have rogue sites sitting out there for five years untouched. And the next, just this whole nomenclature change with uh, permissions and and security. So the, the permission UI really had a lot of changes, and now a lot of it is referred to as sharing. So you know you would go through and share a site, a library, or a document with someone, um, and it basically whenever you share that, it, it pretty much just adds somebody to a SharePoint group, um, or it adds them explicit permission onto whatever object that you're sharing. And in SharePoint Online, you can actually um, additionally share um, content with external users, people who are actually outside of your organization, just by using a, uh, their email address, and then it'll prompt them to create a Microsoft account and get access. So next here, there's a couple new uh, site templates, but the big one here that I would call out is the project site template. Um, and it's got some great new web parts on there to really provide some, all those simplistic, but you know, really powerful way to, uh, to basically run projects. So you get this project uh, summary and timeline web part, that you can add tasks on there and it, it ties right into all the new task list functionality that I'll talk about here in a minute. And it really more greatly aligns with and really lines up with Project Professional 2013. So if you're used to using Project, you know, uh, Microsoft Project, the local um, application, then it really syncs and pairs with this extremely well. In the content management space, so uh, first big one I saw was really with versioning. So in previously with SharePoint 2010, whenever you use versions in your you know, SharePoint document libraries, um, it stores a full copy of that document per version. So if you have a 5 meg PDF and you store 10 versions of it, you know that's 5 times 10, right? So it can really start to eat up a lot of your content storage. But now in 2013, it only stores that delta between each version. So it can really save you a ton of disk space. And the next thing I know a lot of users really been rejoicing about this is that now cross browser you can actually drag and drop files if whenever you want to upload content into SharePoint libraries you can just drag and drop them from Explorer um, and like I say that's cross browser. So next just some couple things with video management. So now you have this built-in support for either uploading videos or embedding videos from YouTube or Vimeo or whatever. So you don't have to do this whole trickery with content editor web parts and pasting embed code in there and, and kind of had to kind of hack your way through it a little bit. So it really now provides you this ability to, you know, you can build robust video libraries in one place but have your content sourced either from local videos that you upload or internet videos maybe from your company YouTube channel or, or whatnot and I'll have them show in one library all together and you can put in tags and, and various things. So next thing you can do this uh, has this, these new web parts called code snippets, and so no longer do you have to actually do the usual again using content editor web parts. If you wanted to put on like JavaScript or CSS um, on your particular uh, page, SharePoint page, so now there's a dedicated web part. It's technically called the script editor web part um, that's designed for that purpose. So um, you know it's designed to actually hold uh, HTML code, and you can actually uh, paste embed code in there as well. So as I mentioned before, uh, they've been the uh, task lists have really gotten a lot of of, of improvements. Um, you know, really a, a big rewrite, and so you can actually now complete a task just by uh, checking this checkbox over on the the far left column there, 
and that will actually uh, mark it complete. Uh, it will mark the status complete. It will cross it out. Um, if you have tasks that are past due, it will automatically color them red. Um, and then you can also create subtasks, you know, the tasks that are indented from a parent, just by going on the ribbon in there and saying indent or outdent. So you get a lot of this, a, a lot of really robust functionality that you're, if you pull up the project interface, it would look very, very similar. So workflows also went under um, a, a really complete o overhaul, really becoming a whole separate service from, from SharePoint now. So you still have your SharePoint 2010 workflow templates like approvals and disposition and, and three stage and, and, and things like that. But now you can really choose to write a, um, when you pull up SharePoint Designer, you can actually choose, do you want to, run, want to write a 2010 workflow or a 2013 workflow? And in 2013 workflow, there are some new actions that you can do that are uh, fairly powerful, um, where you can actually do um, stages, you can do looping, you can do all those those, those kinds of things. Um, a, on the screenshot on the right, you can see a few of the different actions where you can actually do, like use dictionaries and call web services and, and things like that. Which makes it a lot easier to kind of work with you know, make actually start doing some real business processes in, in SharePoint. So a lot of stuff going on with search. So one of the uh, first things is, so search in 2010 was actually a separate product that you had to get licensed for and install, but now this is now a built-in feature. So not every single feature, but, you know, pretty much 80% of the fast search product got baked, uh, is now built into the SharePoint server uh, product. So next, um, I know one thing that this is really helpful to, to me a lot and to a lot of my uh, our, our clients is that now there's a contextual search bar in every Lister library built in. So now you don't actually have to do any filter web parts and can you know do connections and modify the view and do all that kind of nasty stuff. Um, this is just baked into every single Lister library. And so now natively, uh, we actually can natively crawl PDFs. Uh, with a built-in eye filter, so we don't actually have to install any Adobe eye filters to be able to uh, look at, have search, look at the content of PDFs. It's extremely nice. Um, next one, so one huge change here is with this new web part called the content search web part. And so basically this is really meant to take the place of the content query web part as it, it does the same thing of aggregating content, but it does it using uh, the search index instead of just dynamically looking in the content uh, database. Um, so here's an example, um, and it basically is displays the results using, it renders those results using display templates, and I'll talk about those here in just a second. So, but basically the bottom line is that you don't actually have to do um, any kind of XSLT um, anymore to actually, if you want to change the way that those, those look. So lastly, there's this whole concept of the introduced for continuous crawls. And so, you know, most people are used to going in there and defining a incremental or full crawl schedule. And so you might have to wait up to a half an hour before your, your content's going to get updated. So now you can have these multiple crawl processes that are running that they don't wait for, you know, five can start just on a delayed kind of process. And so each one doesn't wait for the other to finish. Um, and so they just start in a cascading uh, way. So that way you can have your content be upload a document and it show up in search results in two minutes, um, which, is, which is very helpful for a lot of really important content that's, that's changing a lot. So as I mentioned with the display templates, um, basically those really now can control the rendering of search result output and it uses standard HTML and CSS and JavaScript that you can actually create there in the browser. So in this example you have your standard search, search results, but um, you also have this uh, there on the left and then over on the right you have this hover panel which gives you kind of like a live preview of your, of your site uh, or anything like that or in case if you have Office web apps it will show actually your live document. Um, so every item in the results kind of has a display template, and then the hover panel has a display template. Um, and these display templates reside in the master page gallery. And they're just, you can do so much with them. You can actually make navigation with display templates. I mean, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. And the huge takeaway here is that you don't have to mess with XSLT anymore. It's all standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, and it kind of messes, it uh, pairs with the display templates, pairs with the result types that, to really kind of control uh, what, um, what different content that you have. And then, um, so when you hover over a document, for example, so if you have Office Web Apps, then you can get a preview of the actual document. You can scroll through the document live, 
and you actually get see where it says take a look inside there. It actually shows you bubbles up the sections from the document there, um, you know, on that hover panel. And so you can you know edit you can get those links then those action links at the bottom where you can edit it, follow it, send it. You can email somebody a link. You can view the library where it resides. Um, and that that hover panel hover panel is extensible, so you can add your own links to to things in there if you want to do anything custom. So a lot of stuff going on here on the social aspect of SharePoint, firstly with community sites and community portals. So community sites here are basically discussion boards on Uber steroids, um, and they really provide a site template for having this multiple topical conversations, but it also gives you like, feet. you can have actually uh, answers marked as featured answers in threads. You can have uh, different contributors build reputations uh, and everything like that. So it's much more than just a standard dis discussion board. And then if you have multiple community sites, you can create a community portal, which just using search dynamically, all you have to do is create the site and nothing else. It'll actually dynamically find all of your different community sites and render kind of a roll-up list, if you will, uh, in a community portal. So of course, with um, a lot of the new features and stuff here in, in, uh, with, from the social side is, um, all this new microblogging functionality, being able to do news, having news feeds, doing mentions, hashtags. Uh, you can have the news feeds functionality on team sites and everything. So eventually this is all going get, to get replaced with the Yammer platform that Microsoft bought, uh, acquired a few years ago. But for now, um, if you install SharePoint 2013 on-premise, you can still uh, retain this default uh, social functionality. Um, and it just gives you that much more typical expected social um, functionality of doing social interactions uh, that you're kind of used to used to doing, but as I said, they're not going to be doing any new development really in in lieu of Yammer. But you can also now even uh, outside of Yammer, you can actually just do all this following. So you can follow a site, a document, or uh, keyword tags or people. So you can get any of their updates, things that have changed within those will then show up in your newsfeed. And as I said, so really the kind of the future is really going into Yammer integration. So for now, you can integrate with it, and then eventually this is going to replace the out-of-the-box stuff. Uh, Yammer is available today. You can just go to yammer.com, sign up. Uh, you don't have to have SharePoint to, to uh, do it, but like I said, eventually it's going to be part of SharePoint. So next, a lot of changes kind of here with my sites and, and stuff. So they introduced this whole concept of OneDrive for Business. So it's basically... Um, their personal my documents in, in SharePoint, but it also provides the ability to have offline sync, uh, you know, via a desktop app. And there are mobile apps as well that you can have. Um, and it's actually, if you have a Windows phone, there's actually a mobile app for just um, you could actually use both your personal my drive. Uh, I'm sorry, your personal OneDrive or your company OneDrive for for business. Um, and if you're on premise, then your size is limited to the just really the capacity of your servers. Um, in SharePoint Online, it's going to be uh, limited to its one terabyte by default, and eventually they're going to make it unlimited. So a lot of, a lot of really powerful storage there. So a uh, huge impact here with this whole concept of, of apps. And so just like your mobile device, uh, kind of what they're calling now add-ins, really have arrived in, in SharePoint. And add-ins really provide this, they provide a, a functionality. They actually do something. They actually do behavior. Um, and if you notice, I said add-ins and not apps. And so basically, they're the same thing, but Microsoft is really changing their nomenclature again to just more align with the rest of their Office frameworks and everything. So a lot of the, the a lot of the web pages and stuff on MSDN and TechNet haven't caught up. But if you see apps or if you see add-ins, they're the same thing, no difference. They're just add-ins of what you'll see in the future. Um, but now you can actually have you can go get apps from the public SharePoint store uh, out from the internet, or you can actually have a a private internal company app store where if you write your own apps and you want to publish them there and just keep them internal and let people install those that you can do that as well. Um, and a lot of improvements here with access services as, as that now access services actually uses um, apps now. So whenever you create a access app in 2013 it actually creates a real full SQL database behind the scenes and not some kind of weird proprietary web database. Um, it's a full SQL database. You can pull up SQL and, and look at that live database just like anything else. Um, so it gives you a lot of, of power. Uh, being able to use you know, your full access client to design your app and everything, but then be able to use it in browser. So if you just want to see what the public SharePoint store is and what all the different apps and everything like that, you can just go to store.office.com. 
and then just click on SharePoint under product. And of course, just while we're talking about SharePoint 2013, I just have to mention 365. So 365 is Microsoft's cloud-hosted SharePoint called SharePoint Online. And SharePoint Online is just one service among many that you can get on a per-user subscription basis of 365. So if you're thinking of going to 365, um, and you know, then you're definitely not doing an upgrade, you're actually migrating because you're moving to a whole other platform. And it doesn't have the same code base as 13 on-premise as Microsoft has continued to really improve it, make new release changes, and it also provides features that will never come to on-premise. And I won't go through all these features, obviously, but in just in some scenarios for a lot of folks, 365 is a great viable option. Um, it, you know, it works really well in hybrid scenarios. Um, it just provides really rich functionality across devices. So in summary, I really think that uh, SharePoint 2013 and online really provide some great new improvements that can certainly prove enough value to uh, want to consider an, an, an upgrade. So when looking at doing an upgrade, there are definitely multiple factors to consider. So I want to kind of take you through a few of those. And one big thing to consider here a part of, as part of any upgrade is to know what features have been removed in the new version. So obviously this isn't everything, but this is just what I would consider to be the big one. And first of all, a couple of site templates got pulled for all of the meeting workspaces and the document workspaces got removed. Um, also the ability to do PowerPoint broadcasts or slide libraries, which I don't think most people were really using anyway, so that shouldn't be a big deal to anybody. Um, but this one has really caused a lot of debate in the community um, that in SharePoint Designer 2013, there's no more design view. Um, all you have is, is code view. So you can't very easily do conditional formatting on data view web parts and stuff that, that you might be used to doing. It's all you got to do it in, in code. So web analytics was actually removed in 2010 in its current form, but it was reintroduced in 13 as part of the search platform and search service and functionality. So it's still there, just kind of reincarnated a little bit. Um, next, a lot of people might, if you had the enterprise edition of SharePoint, then you, in 2010 you had this chart web part. And, um, and, and it worked, you could actually, they're built in, you could render SharePoint list data and, and a few things like that, but that's now been pulled from 2013. Really, they want you to be using Excel services, you know, as it provides so much more charting and everything functionality now with PowerView and all the different add-ins that, that you can do now. And then lastly, uh, just with visual upgrades, so when you upgraded 2007 to 2010, you had this option of preserving the look of the 2007 site even though the content was actually running on 2010. And this has all now been done away with, and it's actually made a lot better uh, in 2013, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. And one last thing before I move on from deprecated features is that you might have heard this, but you might not be aware of it. Um, but if you have or going to 365, that they are removing the ability to actually have this task roll-up link in your uh, profile page, as well as the, and this is a much bigger one, having the, the ability to sync task lists to Outlook. Um, I've never been able to get a good explanation of to why they're pulling this. Um, is so so far it's still on the books to be uh, to be pulled until here September uh, of 2015. So just be aware of it. It might they might come back off of it, but for now it's still going to be pulled. So this is the message that you'll see in your 365 message center. So another consideration in looking at upgrades is going to be how you can upgrade. So I want to kind of take you through a few different the new, uh, the available methods that you have going from 10 to 13. So you really got two options. So first, if you notice, there is no more in-place upgrade. So 7 to 10, you could actually take your same servers and, and go in place. You can't do that anymore. You can only do what they call DB attach. And basically what that means is you build a new SharePoint 2013 farm, you backup restore, move your databases over from 10 to 13, you upgrade all your service applications, you upgrade your content databases, and then you can do per site collection upgrades. So if you remember when I said that there was no more visual upgrade, that's because now when you upgrade your content databases, your site, your, um, site collections actually stay in true native 2010 format until you upgrade them. So it actually has a whole separate 14 hive versus 15 hive, um, and it runs the 2010 visual, it runs the 2010 schema, everything is pure native 2010. So, you know, visual upgrade was kind of fakery, if you will, um, whereas this is true native until you upgrade your site collection to 2013, it'll still be true 100% 2010. So this whole method is, is typically what you would consider a true upgrade. 
And according to a recent study by AIIM, only 6% of those polled actually said their SharePoint implementation was a complete unsounding success, 6%. So given that, I'm sure it's generally not going to be best practice to, you know, for people to just forklift your data over without giving it any kind of planning thought or anything like that. And we're definitely going to be talking about that here, here soon. So your other upgrade option, not really upgrade, but your other option is going to be third-party tool migration. So you basically, you're still creating your new farm and everything, but instead of taking your databases over, you're using a third-party tool to do selective um, content migration. So you can actually just, um, you know, bring over this, this sub, uh, subsite or this site collection or this list or library on an individual basis. So we'll go over those pros and cons here in just a minute. Um, but if you are migrating to 365, then your only option is to actually use a third-party tool um, unless you're going to be just manually uploading content. And eventually this might change as Microsoft is making a import service, but for now that service is only uh, available for Exchange. So if you actually want to, you can actually ship them your hard drives and stuff with data on them, and they'll create all and import all your Exchange data. And there have plans to open that up to SharePoint and other other services, but for now it's, it's, it's Exchange only. All right, so which do we choose? Um, do we want to upgrade or do we want to migrate? So here are just a few uh, questions I wanted to throw out just to kind of get your, your mind thinking. So do we need to move sites around or do we need to uh, change URLs or, or uh, move site collections or change site collections to subsites? Um, are your content databases allowing site collections to have kind of more than the 200 gig recommendation? Um, are your permissions out of control and you really need to really, you, you want to do like a big uh, permission reset, if you will. Do you have a lot of, um, unused content out there, uh, you know, just have, just have a few, more than just a few lists of libraries that aren't used anymore. Um, are you wanting to do a really big major cleanup as part of this project? Um, do you have issues with performance and SharePoint being really slow or whatnot? Maybe the hardware is out of date. So um, is the architecture for SharePoint really not set up for best practice? So looking at your, um, you know, your service accounts, are you kind of using one service account for every, using the farm account for everything or are you using you know, 20 service accounts and you want to pare that down, is SQL not optimized for all your different, you know, where your databases and your logs and your TimDBs are all split between different uh, databases, kind of that's uh, best recommended uh, best practice. Or maybe they're not formatted to 64K clusters that's really optimized for, um, for, for SharePoint. Or, you know, maybe you want to do actually replace the, uh, you need to upgrade or replace the operating system. You know, maybe it's still running Windows Server 2003 or Small Business Server or, some other thing, um, or you want to upgrade SQL 2008R2 up to SQL 2012 or 14. Um, so I would definitely say that if you even had an inkling or a spine tingle that actually maybe gave you a thought in the direction of actually saying yes to any of those, then I would definitely suggest doing a migration and not doing upgrade. But I mean, I joke, but I mean, seriously, if you answered yes to, you know, one or more of those, um, I think a migration could certainly be in, in your future. So, all right, so we know we're going to be going to 13, so what are the things that might break? So, FAB40 sites. So, I think really at this point, this is the true and final death of the FAB40 sites. Um, if you don't know what they are, don't worry about them, but um, they won't migrate up to 13. You shouldn't try to migrate them to 13. You should just kind of, what I say, cease and desist right now and just let them die. Um, find find uh, new ways to be able to do that functionality, what you want to be able to do. Um, so, if you have highly branded sites in 2010, uh, you know, with a lot of customization, you know, you might have to do a lot of work to actually get them to play with 13. So with all the new web technology, sometimes it's just better to make, make more sense just to start fresh for 2013 for, for branding. And if you still have any 2010 sites uh, in 2007 visuals, you definitely want to convert those over to 2010. If you have any uh, other customizations like list or library view customizations or like with designer, in infopath, web park connection, you just want to definitely test those to ensure that they still work. If you're doing workflows, you want to make sure just that you test those, or do they need to be rewritten so maybe they, uh, the 2013 workflow platform will open up a lot of new possibilities for you. Um, claims authentication is now kind of the default for 2013 web applications, so you definitely recommend to actually convert your classic, um, if you're using classic authentication in 2010, you want to convert those over to, over to claims before you're looking at migrating. You know, maybe you're using like Kerberos with forms authentication or using a custom authentication provider maybe. So you just want to be sure to test those to make sure those are going to still work in 2013. And so maybe you're also using a lot of third-party software. So maybe you've got, um, are, are there 2013 versions or, or um, app versions um, of the software that you're using? 
is it going to be compatible with SharePoint Online? I mean, so you just have to be sure to be able to answer those those questions. So we're also looking at what might break. There are some considerations um, for developers out there. So I'll just kind of run through these quickly. But um, with Parm and Sandbox Solutions, they're still going to be supported. They're not going anywhere. But Sandbox Solutions are only declarative Sandbox Solutions are fine. Basically, if your Sandbox Solutions have code in a managed code, then those are going to be deprecated. And I really recommend uh, just there's a lot of changes going on here. Um, so I'd really recommend uh, you just need to evaluate your solutions and see about really trying to convert them over to the app model where possible. And I'd really recommend you go watch the session from the Ignite conference this last year, uh, the Future Proof Your Farm Solutions, and I give you the URL there. Uh, they really go through the whole hour really walking through that, what that looks like and kind of what, what they, there are a lot of their recommendations. And then I've got a link to all these at the end of this deck as well. So where they're putting all their time and efforts are going to be in the app model. So if you can use that as much as possible, that's really where they they want you to do it. And also, if possible, they really want you to try to have the same development model. So even if you're not going to online and you're staying on premise, there's still really no reason not to go ahead and try to use the client side object model um, and using the app model and everything to to try to um, you know make all your customizations. And then lastly, you can use the uh, code analysis framework tool. It's a free tool from Microsoft to really test those farm solutions um, and it'll measure it against the 365 model to really tell you what's going to work or, or not work. So just a quick note here on version upgrading. So I'm not talking about uh, migration, but um, if we're talking about version, this is going to be what version is going to upgrade. So if you have standard, you can go to standard, enterprise goes to enterprise. Um, and then if you're looking at the product, so foundation can go to foundation 13 or server 13. Server 10 goes to server 13. Server 13 will go to, um, to 2016. If you have search server, that's got to go to SharePoint server 2013. And then project server 10 goes to project server 2013. So another consideration that you might have is just worry about is the, the support life cycle. So 2010, as you see here, is going to expire here at the end of this year for mainstream support. But extended support goes until the year 2020. 2013 is still going to be a ways out then. And so what does extended support mean? It basically just means that you cannot request any design changes to the product, and they're only going to be putting out uh, security updates um, unless you are, are like a premier customer. So you shouldn't need to worry about really doing, um, you know, really worry about like the left side, the SharePoint's not going to be supported anymore is, is going to be a big issue. So talking about planning here for a minute. So our managing partner, Curtis Hughes, really gives a whole presentation on what he calls the uh, seven deadly sins of collaboration. And I pulled this slide out as I just wanted to highlight here in our context of discussing planning. I've got a link to the whole his whole session video um, here at the end of the slide deck. And I really recommend that you go check it out. So most of us kind of think of projects like this in a, as a bell-shaped curve where you do a little work up front, there's a lot of work in the middle, and then there's a little work you know, as you get near the end. But in fact, for successful projects, it's kind of the opposite. Um, and over, over the long haul, not only is the risk of failure lowered, but the costs are actually lower too. So it's, it's easy to say, yeah, we'll do that, but typically we see it almost never happens. So, you know, really 40% of, of planning is really going to be where you're building that comprehensive roadmap and plan with buy-in from your executives, you know, top to bottom, from executives all the way down to the end users. And only 20% is really technology where the technology is important, but it's not critical to, it's not what makes the project really critically successful or not. And then your other 40% is really going to be spent putting tools and policies in place to actually govern the project and ensure long-term consistency um, and, and project success. So having seen how important planning is to project success, here are just some things that when you're looking at doing your, your uh, SharePoint upgrade plan, here are some things that you really should be included. So any of your business end user requirements, rollout schedule and phases, um, a review or audit of all your SharePoint environments, uh, governance plans, user adoption plans, communication plans, training how the user is going to get trained and you know how to know to use the new environment, and then how are you going to be testing it? All right, you know, are you going to be testing it all at once or whatnot? So this chart here is just one sample of how we charted the time for a client project. And if you notice, governance and, uh, and was really high and support was really low at the beginning of the project. But then as we got towards the end of the project, it really flipped. So, you know, things are just kind of got where governance was on autopilot, but then support went high because it's, it went in production and, and people needed a lot of support. But then training was consistent throughout the, the life of the project. 
So Aries want to look at a few reasons about you know kind of why you why you should really be upgrading. So as you saw, planning is going to be crucial to having project success, and you should really start by identifying a vision with goals for really what your SharePoint implementation is going to be. And ideally, those are going to be simplistic um, and not specific to any kind of pro specific project or version of SharePoint. So um, you know, not just your vision for 2013 or whatever, but just your vision for SharePoint in general. So here's just a quick example of, of one we just kind of pulled from the internet. Um, so I said the corporate internet is going to be for easy access to internal information such as policies, forms, and templates, communication of non-time sensitive information, collaboration among project teams, functional groups, and offices. So you know, fairly succinct and, and simple. So once you have your vision, you want to identify those business drivers and goals that are going to help support that vision. So some example drivers could be new features, costs or licensing, um, architecture issues, um, social collaboration features, end user requirements, or uh, UI improvements for the users. So when you're creating these drivers, they really should be measurable. So a couple of examples are just to say, you know, we want to try to reduce software license costs by 30%, or use branding and MDS features to really um, increase user adoption by 20%. So really something that you can measure, you know, because how do you know if you're successful at the end of the project unless you have where you can actually measure that success. So when you're talking to the business about their different requirements that they want um, you know, going forward, what they want to keep, what they want to change, what are new requirements, um, you shall not, not, not forget about some changes that are going to impact user adoption um, like this list here. So just for example, um, this new app nomenclature, you know, people aren't going to know what a app versus a web part is per se. We, uh, SharePoint actually in 13 pulled the uh, sign in as different user. That's gone. You can add it back, um, but by default it's turned off. Um, again, just like I said, for designer, design views is gone. No breadcrumb or up folder anymore. Um, with uh, UI changes for site owners, like they move site actions around and creating subsites is now different pages. Permissions is now sharing and, and everything. So there's just a lot of easy, easy for a lot of uh, users to get, to get confused. So the big question is, you might be thinking is, you know, should I, what about SharePoint 2016? Should I wait for that to be released? And during the What's New uh, for IT Professionals session uh, at Ignite, the senior technical program manager, Bill Baer, uh, actually said no. And that's because uh, you should not wait. You should upgrade to 13 now. And that's because to upgrade to SharePoint 2016, it actually requires all your site collections to actually already be in 2013 mode. You cannot upgrade directly from 2010 to 2013. So just kind of looking ahead, um, before we look at the vision and the roadmap for SharePoint that I want to show you for 2016, I just want to quickly recap where Microsoft is going at, as, as a company. So at this year's Ignite conference, what they really kind of said that the Microsoft's mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more and enable transformation. And the CEO, Satya Nadella, really created this mobile-first, cloud-first vision where he talks about where mobility um, is in the sense of the experience and not the device. So it's really, you know, the user should have the same experience whether they go to their mobile phone, their tablet, their desktop PC, they, you know, no matter where you go, you should be able to have the same experience. And so you can really start to see, you know, how they're implementing that in Windows 10 uh, and universal apps. So, you know, where Windows 10 on your on your phone, on, you know, Windows 10 on a, on a Surface or tablet or a PC, it's all going to be exactly the same code base. There aren't different versions for Windows Phone and 10 and, and Windows Desktop 10. It's all the same. So looking forward to SharePoint 2016, this is how the, really the product team defines it uh, there at Ignite, where they basically said it's a comprehensive solution for connected uh, information work that preserves structured processes, compliance, and IT investment optimized for the way people work through an, e through an easily managed integrated platform. So let's kind of look at some specifics here. So I'd really recommend that you guys go watch um, all the sessions from Ignite. We're actually all up on channel nine right now. So you can actually go watch the entire evolution of SharePoint where he introduces SharePoint 2016, shows a demo, and they go through all this in, in detail. But just a quick note, so 365 will continue to be e evolved where SharePoint adds new features and patches and experiences all in the cloud first. So like features like NextGen portals, Dell, all you know, all these things that are based on the Office graph and machine learning. But one thing is also very clear was that on-premise is not going anywhere. That made it very clear that they're not going to kill on-premise anytime soon. 
So SharePoint 2016 is basically going to be a feature refresh from 365, but with improvements to really connect the cloud and on-premise. So this is really where the first time where the cloud, the cloud software, is going to actually driving the on-premise software instead of typically the other way around. So a couple of big features to look for or is they're putting a big emphasis on hybrid to really improving this whole experience between your on-premise and cloud. Um, a big thing for search and office graph, uh, this whole mineral where you're going to have, um, you can, services are going to run as services, uh, you know, more like it's going to be running a search server, a web front end server. Zero downtime patching where they're really trying to make patches really simple and easy to, to do almost without being able to, having to take the server down. Um, and really increasing these boundary limits where um, you know you can get beyond that 200 gig uh, content database limit or the 5,000 list threshold limit, things like that. And the hardware specs are going to be very similar to 13 with the only exception that uh, it's going to require a SQL Server 2014 with SD1. And right now, if you actually see, it's going to be, uh, they're quoted to release it here Q2 of 2016. So lastly here, I just want to wrap up and just look at some very tactical ways that you can get started here within this process. So first, we're going to need to do a little investigative work. Um, and what we want to do is actually know, uh, really it's hard to define, um, is you want to, you know, why you want to upgrade. So really create that vision, identify a business value and, and drivers. Uh, know when you want to upgrade and uh, establish that roadmap and really map out um, your, and plan your, your upgrade. And then nextly, you want to look at how you want to upgrade. So you really want to choose uh, your methodology you want to mitigate those risks for, for training and user adoption. Uh, really start communicating these plans with all the different users and so they, the users really know what's coming uh, and everything. So ideally, this is not going to be a IT-run project. You want to build a project team with a steering committee with, that has representatives across the business. And just kind of lastly here, I mean, if you get stuck, be sure to ask for help. Um, another statistic here from AIM said that a majority of SharePoint deployment, 61%, or stalled, struggling, or failing. Um, and then 50% of that 61% that were failing uh, didn't ask for help. So I mean, here at C5 Insight, we really help clients all the time navigate this, this process, so please definitely reach out to us. Um, if you, a lot of this looks really daunting or you need kind of definitely some help advising or actually really help walking through this, this process. So, you know, really actually how you want to get started is really looking at um, auditing your, your environment. So you're going to need to do some investigative work of literally looking at what are your most used and unused sites? Uh, where are your largest libraries, your customizations? What sites have workflow? What sites use third-party products and features? And there are third-party tools or um, PowerShell scripts you can use to help de determine these. I've listed a, a few here. Um, next, I would recommend you build a site uh, topology map in, in Visio to really give you this visual of how your um, actual SharePoint sites are laid out that you can actually use PowerShell to get a dump of all your sites and then suck that into Visio to really build this um, this topology diagram for you. And then lastly, just thinking about uh, cleaning up your content. So I get asked by a ton of clients um, whether they need, you know, whether they should uh, clean their content up now or they should do that first or wait till after they migrate. And I strongly recommend uh, really starting deleting that content now before you migrate. That's less content you have to back up, look at, report on, migrate, deal with. Um, some of that cleanup can happen during the migration process. So if you're using a migration tool and you want to clean up versions, so you can say uh, the tools usually today will allow you to specify only migrate the one version or three versions. So just kind of lastly here, um, you know, in summary, you just want to, you know, after, once you kind of audit your environment and everything, you can start meeting with the business to determine their business requirements. Um, and you can precede a lot of those conversations with analytics from your current farm uh, to, to use for those discussions. So look at search results uh, and a lot of those search reports that you can use. Go get site stat results from the out-of-the-box um, reports that you can have and, and turn on. So this is just a quick little dashboard that I built. I just took some out-of-the-box uh, SharePoint rep uh, analytic results and I just took those CSVs, brought them into Excel and uh, used PowerView to uh, you know, kind of create this dashboard for people. So you can give the business a quick little look of who are the top you know, people hitting the site, what are the top pages, um, what are the big search queries that, that are, how often are they using search, um, you know, just different things like that to really drive those conversations. 
and really start deciding what your methodology is going to be, upgrade or migrate. Start creating your uh, migration plan documentation, those governance and training and testing and communication. And then finally, you can just start doing your testing, work on training, and actually doing an implementation. So that's actually all the content I have. And so here, uh, these slides are going to be published online, so I don't expect you to try to grab them now. But um, I've got two slides here at the end that really give you a lot of resources for doing upgrades, um, you know, various things. Our, our webinar link is on here and everything, the Ignite sessions, and then developer resources. So with that, I think I want to go ahead and open, turn it back over to Allison for Q&A. Just do one more slide. Yep. Just wanted to go ahead and let you guys know about our other upcoming webinars. If you want to just bookmark events.c5insight.com, no, no www there. We offer a lot of content, both strategic and tactical, around collaboration and relationship management, uh, which is to say SharePoint, Dynamics, CRM, and uh, Salesforce, and the best uses of those tools. But through here, if you think of any, the easiest way to reach us is luck at c5insight.com, or you're welcome to hit up just www.c5insight.com. Have a look around, and there's a contact us, as well as links to our social media pages. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you guys will join us on future webinars, and uh, have a great day.